It's a strange looking pepper, in my opinion. Let's see, I've got the tag still down here. So this is a sweet pepper pimento, and it looks like a really long pepper. Does that look like a really long pepper to you? Guten yardening, everybody. In our last video, I gave you a tour of our new front yard and space. So we're gonna pick up where we left off with some of the tour of the garden that we've already had in place all season. So we're gonna start right here with our okra. This is the first time that we have successfully grown okra. I guess technically it's the first time we've really attempted the okra. But you can see in here, a couple of them are pretty big. We've, we've probably waited a little bit too long on these. And there are a couple more coming in right here. But these are looking nice and they're, they're finally starting to provide lots of okra. So we're gonna have to harvest some of those soon. So that's our okra. We have two different varieties of okra that we planted. Our honeyberries, of course, are early season um, and they're starting to fade back as the season has continued on. Right past our honeyberries, we have a cucumber that we transplanted into this pot a while ago. You know, one of the things we learned, <laughs> not quickly enough this season, uh, but with our cucumbers is that when we grow them in pots and containers, you know, pots dry out really quickly the nutrients also seem to wash out more quickly. So this one was transplanted and was doing very poorly. You can actually see some of the improvements maybe here. Now let's look down in here. This is a, this is a male flower right here. So you can see behind it, there's no fruit there. That's just a thin little stem, but there are a bunch of female blossoms right here. And again, we're, we're attracting the, the bees with a lot of our pollinators here in the front yard and space. So we're attracting the bees, so they'll come in here and this should get pollinated nicely. Also, do you like our, our fancy setup here? This is a <laughs> cage and then an inverted cage on top, tied together at the top so nobody gets poked. And it gives plenty of height development. Um, we tied it, we twist tied it. Uh, but this is a way to modify a cage to give more room for whatever you're growing to actually pop up there and hang on. And I tell you, this, uh, this cucumber is, is vining up and taking advantage of this and the rope that we had uh, added to the side. Earlier, this bale housed a squash that did not perform very well. So we've added a little bit more soil on top. We've put in a purple kohlrabi and off to the side you can see what looks like a whole bunch of weeds growing well those aren't weeds we've got lettuce growing in here we have a bunch of salad mix arugula or rocket growing in here um, so this is a bale that will look vastly different here in a couple weeks because you know that the lettuce and the arugula they grow super fast and so we're going to see how that turns out. We learned something this year that makes perfect sense and actually wish we had known it early on about growing in bales. There are some plants that make the most sense to grow first in bales. Like a nice tomato would be a good example of something to grow the first year in a bale. And then you let it break down and start to decompose. And it's that second year that you plant your potatoes or, you know, your root crops just in general, sweet potatoes, for example in the bale because then it's looser and it has more room for it to develop well we've tried to grow some sweet potatoes in bales this year but it's the first year with it so i have no idea what that's going to look like when we actually get to pull it up right next door to our bale we have some strawberries that we transplanted last year from the strawberries that we planted beside our blueberries and these are finally starting to take off and you can see they're sending out runners. Now this runner has attached itself to the ground. And since this is year two, and we have, um, we have the expectation of some fruit later on. Uh, this is a variety that will provide us some fruit here shortly. If these runners, uh, well here is a great example of a runner that hasn't attached here. You see they've already started to root. We're gonna start collecting these again because these look nice and healthy to replace some of our third year strawberries in a different area. 
So we want to get as many of these as possible to keep our strawberries going as long as possible. I tell you, weeds get away from them. The mulch here in this little stretch is not deep enough. I mean, it's, it's not terrible, but it's not deep enough. And you can see the weeds come in quickly. And when you're busy with everything else going on, <laughs> those weeds can start to take over. All right, we're back at our columnar apple trees. If you've, if you've seen any of my tours before, you've probably seen that I've mentioned these trees. They're some of my favorites here on the property just because of how they grow. This columnar apple, which has three apples on it this year, I'm so excited because these are, I mean, they're ready. We might leave them a couple more days, but they're ready. It'll be our first apples that we've harvested off here. We have a yellow and a red columnar. And one thing's for sure, I'm 100% gonna take care of our trunk this year. You can see a little bit of the damage that the rabbits caused last year. Because again, in the winter time, they're hungry. If you saw our video on the freak storm that we had with those massive winds, it just split our peach tree in half. And that's not ideal. And I think one of the reasons it was able to split it in half was some of that damage that the rabbits had caused. So we're gonna protect it. But the reason that I like these so much is these are columnar apple trees and they're not supposed to get any wider than three feet. So they make a perfect borderline, like border property line tree because we can easily maintain them. They're not gonna spread out everywhere. And this is a narrow space here, a really narrow space. And so we want to make sure that we have something that can grow up but it's not going to spread over and make it difficult or impossible to pass through. And these columnar apple trees are perfect for that. Uh, we have some remnants of a season gone by with a few Japanese beetles. <laughs> but look, there's very little beetle damage as well. Again, if you don't remember this from the first video, these trees are supposed to be the same age, but this one really got roughed up. Ah. Uh, it got roughed up this past winter and it's just now starting to take off again. So we're gonna to try to take good care and bring this one back stronger, stronger than ever. This is our peach, one of our peach trees that we have left. This peach tree was, oh, it's probably about six feet tall now. now this is the first time, this is a, what, year three for this peach tree. And the first, I guess technically two and a half years in, um, the first season, it didn't really do much at all in terms of growing, but now it is starting to grow up there. So when we planted it, I would say this was probably about four feet out of the ground. So we've gained a couple feet, especially this year. You may be wondering what is going on with the netting? Well, the netting is there because of the birds and the Japanese beetles, but primarily the birds, because we have quite a few grapes in here and we wanted to keep those grapes in here. In our live conversation that we were having the other night, last Friday, and we're gonna to try to make that a habit, by the way, we're gonna to try to go live on Friday evening so we can relax and do some question and answers. Um, we talked about one of the fruits that doesn't make it into the house for us. Meaning, I mean, you see it, it looks delicious. So you gotta pick it and you gotta eat it right away. And these are one, the grapes, are one that just typically don't make it in the house. They're absolutely delicious, and you come out and grab a handful of them when you're, when you're in need of a healthy snack. But our grapes this year, we finally have good grapes. I think we'd have had even better grapes if we understood more then that we know now about pruning these back and just how aggressively you have to prune them back once they get started, um, or just a little bit before they really take off. So that's something that we're gonna talk about in a later video and something that we are, that's going to help us, I think, in the future have a much better, more bountiful and um, larger sized harvest. You can see the difference here. These taste amazing, but they're not nearly as juicy and they're not nearly as big. And it's not just the variety, it's because of that lack of pruning. The ones on the left, well, again, they're all delicious. One of the unintended side effects of having this 
draped over here is that our kiwi has really taken off and has not really received any damage from insects, etc. This is again year three. It's all the way up here now. These kiwis seem to grow really well for a period of time, but again, I know patience is key and we really need to learn to be patient with this kiwi. This self-pollinating variety is supposed to, again, self-pollinate, but we haven't seen anything close to resembling flowers or fruits of any kind on here yet. So we're gonna be patient and we're gonna see, you know, in the next season or two, maybe we'll, we'll finally get to see a kiwi for the first time ever. But look at all those grapes. Delicious. Such a wonderful snack. Our butternut squash that's growing along our path here has a couple of fruit on it. I'm not sure that it's gonna perform that much more. But again, this is growing out of our, our hay bale as is our tomato right here. And this tomato is looking really healthy. And nice. so finally it's settled in and it's got some nice fruits coming in on it. Although we are seeing some blossom end rot here as well. And that might be something we have to keep an eye out for as we're trying to fertilize this bale and prep this bale, did we do a good enough job? Um, are we keeping it well enough watered? We're also seeing some of the fruits that did ripen up fall off. And if you look at them, they all have that blossom end rot, which is not something we're, we're uh, desirous of. So again, this is a learning process, part of the experimentation process of trying to grow in a way, in a bale of hay versus in a more traditional method. Well, it looks like this is some more of our okra. These are ready to be taken off as well, but it looks like the wind and the rain has really started to push these over in the last couple days. But we're gonna come out and we're gonna harvest some of these as well to get them off. Again, this is our first time growing okra. So this is a learning process. Now this long bed is where we had our potatoes. This is where our biggest potato harvest came from. Well over 100 pounds of potatoes and you probably notice if you didn't already that our netting is completely removed now except for this little piece that, <laughs> that got left behind. But that massive freak windstorm, 60 plus mile an hour winds, just tore everything up. I mean that netting would have worked in a lot of different scenarios but, but 60 plus mile an hour winds, that's going to manhandle it every single time. So we're looking for some film to put over here. I learned from a phone call just by chance and this maybe is something that will be helpful to you, that when you use PVC, if you get plastic film like you would use at a greenhouse, the PVC, the gases that are released from it, will actually destroy the film. And so if you want to use PVC like we have, you need to paint it or create a barrier. So like an acrylic paint uh, to create a barrier between the PVC itself and the plastic, and then you'll be just fine. I learned that from a phone call the other day searching for the film. I thought that was really interesting. All right, if we continue our tour down here along the fall garden, and this is going to be a major source of our fall vegetables. In our first section, we'll call these uh, spaces between the PVC sections, we have our Romanesco Italia broccoli. This is that broccoli from our uh, fall, uh, fall garden video where we talked about what we were going to grow. This is the one that looks so unique, and there's a picture of it right here. But this one looks so cool. I, I keep describing it as looking like a math problem because to me, that's exactly what it looks like. So we have our, this is another one of the uh, broccolis that Cabbage Moth came and just started eating on. So you can see some of that damage here as we get down here. But I think we've taken care of most of them. And again, we're gonna do that nice cayenne mix on them to try to preserve them in the future. This is strawberry spinach. Now strawberry spinach is a different variety of spinach. And I've seen some really cool varieties here in recent days. But this one actually grows a red type. It looks like almost like a, not a berry. It's hard to really explain. I'll show you a picture of what it looks like. Um, but a bit of red that glows up on the, uh, from the center of it. It's kind of cool. And then we have just some standard spinach growing along the edge. So we didn't just settle for the 
Romanesco Italia here, we tried to fill in the whole space. So by the time that this broccoli has really uh, grown up and expanded out, this spinach will have provided us with quite a bit more uh, vegetable and crop just in general. Right next door, we have our purple kohlrabi. We planted quite a bit of this kohlrabi. I can't stress that enough. We are, we're gonna go crazy on kohlrabi this year. Here's some more of that spinach, the strawberry spinach. We're gonna go crazy with kohlrabi because why not? It's absolutely fantastic tasting, um, extremely versatile, and sadly, the rabbits like it too. So some of these had that um, cabbage moth, cabbage worm damage, but then the rabbits have also come along. So we're gonna again have to protect this with that cayenne mix as best we can. Otherwise they will come out here and they will thoroughly enjoy it. My understanding is, and you can correct me on this one as, as well if I'm wrong, but because rabbits are mammals, they can taste the, um, the spice of the cayenne pepper that we would put in here versus the birds, which can't taste it. The birds don't have that ability. They're not mammals. And so it wouldn't impact what they do. Here's some of our spinach again, looking better. And so when we're trying to defend against those rabbits, I think this will help a lot. And this little section that looks empty, if you look closely enough, you can probably see the outline of a square. And that's because we used our seating square here to plant three different varieties of beets and some more daikon radishes. Wherever we have space, we're maximizing it. That, that's, I'm telling you, that seating square is absolutely phenomenal. And once again, if you haven't checked out our giveaway, our seating square giveaway, you should really do that. The video is called Urban Homestead Dream. All you have to do is watch and leave a comment and you'll be entered in to win as soon as we get to a thousand views. And we're already at almost 500 views as we speak right now. I think it really helped that we had that nice rainstorm last night. You know, when you transplant vegetables, they, they sometimes wilt and, you know, especially if there's the, the really strong heat of the day. But here, these are looking nice. A little bent over because of the wind, but they're looking really nice. I think they're gonna be content where they are. I haven't really spent very much time talking about the strawberries that are on the other side of the path here. They're looking pretty good. They haven't really given us much fruit this year. In fact, it's been a down year overall for our strawberries. And our blueberries are already starting to fade into that kind of reddish tinge of the fall. But our grapes that are along here are, well, there aren't as many left as there used to be. Again, these are some smaller grapes because we didn't prune back enough. But these, even though they look a little lighter, this variety in particular is probably the sweetest variety that we have. Our gooseberries and our black currant and our pink champagne currants, those have all been done for quite some time. But these grapes are looking absolutely wonderful and they taste even better than they look. This one has probably, you know, some of the most plentiful and, and really good sized grapes of any of the ones that we have around on this side. And these are also, again, very sweet, very delicious. And these definitely don't make it inside for us. Some more of our strawberries, and then of course our blueberries down here. We're hoping for some actual good production next year. We're gonna do a better job of keeping these fed, and I think that was part of the issue this year. Down from this angle, we can see our tomato plant here on the left that's been just really productive this season. But it's starting to die back some, and these fruits have been on here far too long. And you can see they're starting to get a little squishy. And so we've got to come in here and harvest them all here quickly. Again, it's one of the challenges when you're growing this much food is to take care and make sure you're actually getting out here and harvesting them in a timely manner so that nothing goes to waste. By the way, the strawberries down here on this end are really starting to produce now. They're starting to come in nicely right on the outside as well. As we enter this part of our garden, and this is our main garden now, I want you to notice something that I find really interesting. This part of the garden was clearly deficient. I mean, we hadn't really done as much, I guess, down with this side. Um, and we started to put some fish emulsion on here. And now the kale that was really not growing up much at all is starting to finally develop itself. And the Swiss chard in the back is looking amazing. 
And this, I'm gonna zoom in here. Here we go. This Brussels sprout plant actually has the biggest sprouts of any of our Brussels sprouts, which is kind of interesting to me, considering how poorly everything else was doing for so long. Our basil has gone to seed completely. This is our lemon basil. If you've never tried lemon basil, it's exactly like it sounds. It smells and tastes like lemon. A little bit smaller leaf here. It's gone to seed. The bees love it, which is absolutely fine. And we're gonna to try to collect seeds from our basil this year for the first time ever. Our cabbage down at this end, again, deficient, really not developing the heads like it did elsewhere. And perhaps one of the more disappointing things to happen in our garden so far, well, at least of late, would be that this was freshly planted broccoli, kohlrabi, and cauliflower. We, we transplanted some seedlings here. And the day after, and this is a, this is a fenced in area. We've got metal uh, fencing on the outside. It's not just the plastic there. But the day after we planted them, somehow the rabbits got in and they find a way where there is no way there, they find a way. And they came in and ate everything off. We left them in the ground just to see if maybe they'll come back a little bit. And there is some life to some of these here, to some of the uh, cauliflower, I guess. We'll see what happens. Um, hopefully they, they make their way back a little bit. But over here we have some volunteer tomatoes. These are all volunteer tomatoes that have come in. We haven't really done much with them. We're just seeing what happens. There are definitely tomatoes on them. Uh, we probably have to stack them up a little bit though, may, uh, tidy them up a little bit. And you can see some of the some of the tomatoes actually on these volunteers are ripening a bit. So one of the things we learned this year had reinstilled to us is that we've been collecting these peppers at this color. You know, this, for example, these are more like a yellow pepper here or a pale pepper, I should say. We've been collecting them at this stage but we know that peppers aren't ripe until they start to turn colors. So we've technically been harvesting them prematurely, you know, before they actually get the full size. And now you can start to see, get down in here, that some of these peppers are turning color. And actually these red peppers over here, let's get inside here. These red peppers are really turning red and looking nice. So we hadn't harvested any of these. It's a strange looking pepper in my opinion. Let's see. I've got the tag still down here. So this is a sweet pepper pimento and it looks like a really long pepper. Does that look like a really long pepper to you? So I don't know if that has something to do with the growing conditions, why they came out this way instead of a longer pepper, but they're starting to turn red. And as we go farther back, these poblano peppers, these are quite a few on this plant. And some of these frying peppers are actually also starting to turn red as well. And these we hadn't really harvested, or we hadn't waited until they turned red. We had been harvesting them earlier. But it's kind of fun to show patience and let them finally uh, come to full maturity. One of the reasons why the green bell peppers are so much cheaper in the store is because you can harvest them young, harvest them before they're fully mature, so you can harvest them faster. But we had patience this year and we're finally getting peppers that have turned to ripeness colors. And behind our peppers, as always, we have our eggplant. Let's reach down in here and see. And they're a nice size right now. Some of them have probably gotten a little bit too big. Um, well, this one's kind of mutated looking. Let's see if we can get down underneath here. Yeah, this one's kind of got like a, a weird lumpy shape to it. That's different some bigger ones down in here that we need to pick and take care of but we did grow several different varieties and you could probably see this is a nice big one down in here several different varieties this year and they're still growing and going strong I mean you can still see flowers up top and oh, look at that a grasshopper they haven't eaten too much of our crop this year although we've seen more of them now or recently in the last month or so than we had seen all season of these grasshoppers and you might have seen the cabbage moth that should fly by as well. Our tomatoes in the main garden here are all ripe. I mean, almost every single tomato on here seems to be ripe now. Again, not overwhelming in terms of overall production, but we are going to have quite a few tomatoes to take in, which is nice. And again, a, a large variety. What you see here represents six varieties alone just between these two trellises. So again, that idea of getting 
more variance, more variety, never hurts anything. And they're all delicious in their own way. We're in the brassica section now. We need to pull out uh, the rest of these broccoli. We had intended to see if any of the little florets would show up and then most of them it didn't actually show up. The one that I intended to pick before, actually in our last harvest video, I ended up not picking. We decided not to pick it because one, the flowers still attract the bees as you can see here. And two, we're gonna try to collect some more seeds from this one. But that being said, our, our chard is still growing strong. Our collard greens, likewise, we still get a lot of, um, a lot of production from our, our collard greens. And there is still some damage. You can see the damage here. Oh, hear that bee. There's still some damage from insects here, uh, but not enough that I'm worried about it. Uh, these are still perfectly edible. And if we come back in here to our Brussels sprouts, you can see these sprouts are looking really healthy um, all the way in here. There's a little bit of insect damage to some of these sprouts, but we're probably a couple weeks away from actually getting our first harvest of sprouts this year. Where our cabbages have come out, tomatoes have volunteered to come in. And then we're going to get a little bit off of these, a few fruits off of these. Not sure exactly what that variety is. It's from a seed from some tomatoes last year. So it probably looks a little bit similar, but it is going to be a different variety than what we've had in the past. And our celery is still going strong. I mean, these four plants here have, have fed us <laughs> and given us so many smoothies so far. Um, it's been absolutely wonderful. And the taste of these celery, again, if you've never tried homegrown celery, it's a stronger taste. I know there are a lot of people that think celery doesn't have any kind of taste at all, but believe me, if you tried these, you would see just the difference in taste overall. The really strong celery flavor. One of the things we learned this time around with our parsley is that, well, we planted too much. This is curly parsley. And we planted several of these and we didn't need nearly as much as we planted. And so this one's going to seed haven't really been able to stay on top of it as well as we'd like. But it's okay, again, we'll, we'll see what we can do with the seeds once they come all the way out. And we're still able to eat off of this, put a little bit of this, a little sprig in this in a smoothie every day. And as you can see, our kale is still going really strong. And this kale, we, we, we pull off of every day and there's still a surplus. And so we're gonna be getting to the point here in a couple weeks probably where we start to figure out what we want to do to preserve more of this. In all likelihood, we'll probably have to dehydrate some of it, which we've done in the past. We've created a kale powder that tastes really great in soups. And we're still using some of the kale powder from last year, but we don't want any of this to go to waste for sure, because it's so nutritional and again, so delicious in our smoothies every morning. And now we're down here at the end of our main garden and this is where we had all of our corn. This is where we got our acoche from our last video and our small corn harvest. And you can see, hopefully, that we're filled up now with other small plants. And what we have in here are cabbages, different types of cabbages, broccoli, cauliflower, all the way through here. We have some more kohlrabi in here. And we're also growing some chard this is our chard right in here and what you might not know is that our mulch you can see this we mowed over all of our corn to shred it up into small pieces and now our corn which fed us a little bit early on is going to help protect preserve keep the moisture in and in the end feed our new garden down here I think that's pretty exciting to be able to use something immediately that we just pulled up out of the ground. So all these stalks are going to good use. We left one bag of potatoes because it's still pretty green from our original planting. So we're going to give that a couple more weeks until it dies back. And down in here we start to get into our sweet potato containers. And you know if you've watched our channel for any length of time, we're obsessed with sweet potatoes. We grow a lot of sweet potatoes. 
I mean, if you look, you got sweet potatoes as far as the eye can see here. As an experiment, we left some of these onions in the ground to do their own thing, to cure themselves. We probably should have lifted them to let them cure. But you can see they're, they're still nice and firm and solid. And they've essentially done the work of what our curing station out front did. I still feel a tiny bit of moisture here, but they've closed up pretty nicely overall. These are the last of the onions that we had in the ground. And these came from um, starts. So none of these flowered, unlike some that we had farther down. And these are our leeks. And our leeks should be ready. Our leeks should definitely be ready to come out of the ground. They've been in there for about four and a half months. And they suggest the growing time for these is about 120 to 130 days. So we're getting ready to pull those out of the ground. And then our back area that had onions before is now filled with these volunteer tomatoes the whole way down and a few weeds, which we'll get to. The volunteer tomatoes the whole way down. And then a couple of onions that went to flower that we're gonna collect the seeds from. But we'll show you that in a different video. Yeah, here we go. Volunteer tomatoes. Really, if you want tomatoes, you plant them once, they're gonna volunteer to come back. They love to exist for some reason. They love to grow. With our sweet potatoes, we've actually looked a little bit, not, not digging around or anything like that, but we've looked a little bit underneath in here, and we've had to go in and cover up some of these sweet potatoes because they're starting to um, peek through a little bit. Uh, so we know that there are sweet potatoes in there. That's always exciting. I, I'm most interested in this set of sweet potatoes here because you can see underneath, these are the ones that are growing in the hay bale. And I have no idea how much space they had in there or how they'll push things around and grow. So once it's time to actually harvest those, we're going to get a much better feel for what it's like to grow in a bale first year, when we probably should have waited until the second year. But look at all these sweet potatoes coming in and all the possibility, both in the containers. These are the gray plastic containers here and in our raised beds in general. And actually, it might be hard to tell almost at this point, but these are the sweet potatoes here that we planted late. We planted these far later than the ones off to the right. And the only difference that you can tell at this point, because they filled out so well, is that these have less Japanese beetle damage than the ones over here. The sweet potatoes in our biggest bed are still flowering a little bit. Here, actually, let's get in here you can see some of the flowers that are still occurring in here. So we're still getting some flowering happening, but we're really close to harvest date on these. I can't, I'm so excited about this one. I mean, I, I get very excited about potato harvest in general, but the sweet potato harvest is something about it because it's all in raised beds. This soil is going to be super easy to work with. We're going to be able to get in there. I just really want to see what all grew. We're starting to see a couple weeks worth of growth now from our carrots that we planted in where our potatoes used to be and the carrots that we planted in the two small raised beds. These are the raised beds that we bought from the store. Really small raised beds, but this is where we had our beets before. And since we've harvested all of our beets, we've been able to get these carrots started. I noticed that some of them are getting shaded out a little bit by the sweet potato because they get so big but we're really excited to see what comes next for these carrots. It's just how well they're gonna develop. I'd say these beds are, I mean, the soil's in there are maybe seven inches. I guess seven inches of soil, somewhere in that neighborhood. And so they have room to grow. We'll see how they do in this soil. We haven't planted the carrots in this soil before. And this is the other bed where our corn was. And we haven't planted anything in here yet. We're gonna plant some radishes in here and some turnips, I believe. If we change our minds, I'll let you know. But this has all been amended. The soil's ready to go. Which brings us up here to compost row, one of our favorite areas. And you can see the butternut squash in compost row. Look down here. 
see how they're coming in. Let's get a better picture of this one. Give you a, a view of the size. Oh, there we go. With my hand beside it. So it's a nice butternut squash. The tomatoes that we pulled, I would say 100, 150 off of the other day. They're ready to be harvested again. So we're gonna have to harvest this very soon. Lots and lots of these tomatoes, both the red and the orange. And our chickpeas have died out almost completely now. So these are gonna be ready uh, to harvest as standard chickpeas very soon. And you can see the difference actually. If you remember the last video where I ate one of these raw, the difference was that one was still green. This one is much harder, uh, definitely in that fully ripe phase. And so it's dried out enough. We could harvest these if we wanted to for the standard chickpea. Farther down on compost row, we have our eggplant, which needs to come out. Beautiful size, perfect size. There's a couple in here actually, still. Oh, there's one back here hidden. Again, this is just prolific production from these plants. The last time I harvested peppers from here, I pulled eight or nine off of, and I see 10 more, 12 more here coming. And here's an, another volunteer tomato plant that came up because why not? It loves the soil so much. I mean, this is the, the compost here and the way these plants enjoy the compost is something to really enjoy. We could have a forest in our compost if we wanted. The potatoes that we planted, the little fingerling potatoes are coming up nicely. They're probably gonna start dying back fairly soon. We talked about having the white containers here and how we needed to wrap them in plastic and that's exactly what we did. We wrapped these in plastic on the outside so that there wouldn't be any sunlight getting through. This is kind of cool. Our neighbor's sunflower has decided to come over and see us. Remember the damage from that, that storm really hit home the size of this one. It really hit home for us and really hit hard. So they're bending everywhere, but you can see the sunflowers and, and uh, the flowers themselves are starting to pop out. So this will be ready to harvest before you know it, be able to cut off, but the back of it hasn't turned color enough yet. I'm gonna say that working in raised beds is a learning experience. I mean, it really is in terms of how much fertilizer do you need? What do you need to do to make sure that the nutrients stay in the soil, that you start off with solid nutrients. And so we've struggled a bit. This is our uh, one of our butternut squash. You can see, I don't know how well it got pollinated, um, but it's, it's struggling a little bit, even though, well, there's still some, this is a male flower here at the end. There's still some life in it, still some life. But, um, you know, our kale seems to be doing fine. Oh, I'm sorry for the wind here. I think, I think it's gonna storm again. Um, and we have our beans. Our beans seem to be doing okay. These are full beans we planted recently. And we also have some bok choy that we planted. It's just starting to come up, as you can see. But our purple kohlrabi, which should have developed more than this, is still sitting there struggling. I think we should have transplanted and moved and separated these out a bit. We never did. So, you know, this is probably the biggest development we have so far, which is what, maybe two inches? No, I wouldn't say that. Maybe an inch and a half in diameter. And the same thing, <laughs> our cucumber struggles continue. We have a few here here and there. Um, and this one's looking pretty pretty rough. We'll have to harvest this one. Um, but it's still, we've we gotten a few cucumbers from our plants, but we really need to do a better job with them. I don't think we gave it enough water this year at all. Our second raised bed, similar results in some ways. The kale is really enjoying life. Our tomatoes that uh, came up in here, they're also doing just fine. I mean, overall, they're not huge. They're not big plants, but they're there. They're, they're doing okay. You do see of uh, insect damage to some of our, our little greens. We struggle with that quite a bit this year. There's some lettuce coming up. We struggle with that, uh, that issue. Uh, one of our melons that came in, and this one's having like a little bit of damage off to the side we're trying to support it as best we can a few peppers here and there these look nice these were transplanted over Whew, windy and we'll pull these tomatoes off here shortly 
again, they may not be a lot, but when you add everything together, you start to see how valuable having multiple options and all this pr production in general, and as many plants as you can fit, I guess, uh, reasonably, is. Our morning glory. Our morning glory is in the mornings, which is why they call it morning glory when these are open up, is absolutely beautiful. So many different colors. And down here, we have some more beans and our carrots that have been coming in for quite a while now. And of course, as I have mentioned in previous videos, our basil, which we're letting go to seed here, uh, but we still pull from uh, for various recipes. There's a potato soup recipe out there that we use, uh, again, from Geeky Gardens. I've mentioned it in the past, but we use this basil for it. Uh, it's really quite tasty. We actually left some of the beans on for a really long time and you can see they're starting to turn yellow but that's because we're going to harvest and see if we can save some of these beans so some of these are intentionally left on there just for our own purposes of experimentation with trying to grow beans ourselves and here are our carrots that we planted a couple weeks ago coming up looking like they're doing pretty well again i think this cooler weather i think the uh, more rain that we're getting now is going to help out quite a bit when it comes to the, their development and the speed of their development going forward. It is supposed to be really nice and cool the next couple of days, in the evenings especially, um, so I think that will help a lot. And here we have our red raspberry, and I'm bringing you over to our red raspberry because this variety, unlike our black raspberry right here, this variety of red raspberry gives us fruit twice. So you can see we have some already ripe fruit here. And that's one of the benefits again of diversifying what you're growing is you're not just getting a single fruit. Some of these are getting overripe already. You're not just getting a single fruit or a single harvest of fruit. There we go. Yeah, that's a little bit, a little bit overripe, but it's still gonna taste delicious. Um, you can get multiple, multiple harvests of fruit. Now these need to be cut back pretty badly. The ones that have already fruited and aren't going to fruit again. The same thing for this black raspberry. We've waited way too long to cut this back. Um, so we're going to show you how we cut it back here in an upcoming video. We should have done this a month and a half ago, really. Um, as soon as it was done fruiting, we should have cut off the ones that aren't going to fruit again so that we can conserve energy for the canes that are going to be fruiting next year. But you know, you get busy and you make excuses. And that's where we are right now. We've got to get caught up with some of these. In our shaded raised bed back here, we have an absolute mess of greens. And again, part of that is due to the fact that we haven't cut back and then shaped this blackberry bush, or black raspberry bush. Uh, but we have our color greens back here that are uh, in need of some serious eating. <laughs> we need to confiscate some of these leaves confiscate. Uh, we have our Swiss chard and the rabbits love this Swiss chard. So you can see they've, they've actually been back here a little bit eating some of our Swiss chard. Uh, but we have our broccoli. We have some more beans. Again, this is a different variety of the pole bean um, than we have over there. And so we're trying to keep some of these seeds and see what we can do in terms of overall seed saving. This is all experimental for us. So we probably have to let some of these dry even longer and some of them, oh, I just dropped it. Some of them are not going to be uh, viable at all. We wanna see if this is something we can do ourselves. And I'm noticing these are really squishy and so not viable. This one probably didn't develop long enough. Here's more of our celery plants. Again, the celery really seems to enjoy the shade uh, these are super healthy. These have been in the ground for how many months now? Still going strong along with the other greens that are over here. So a pretty productive bed for a shaded bed. We can't really complain at all about what we've gotten out of here. Just like our cucumber out front, this one has a taller cage so it doesn't have that inverted cage on top. But we've got a cucumber coming in here and it's looking a little bit healthier than our other cucumbers which is good. Um, a few male flowers there. I know I saw, let's see, yep, yep, there's a female flower right there. So that cucumber's looking much better, much healthier than the ones over here in our raised bed. 
And these are the potatoes that we planted, the store-bought organic potatoes. Actually, our children planted these three. And you can see they are flowering nicely. So that's a good sign for us. It means we have a ways to wait, but they're coming in nicely. And all of them except for one, some more flowers, all of them except for this one came up. So I'd say that's pretty good. Five out of six of these store-bought container, store -bought container potatoes uh, are coming up. So we'll be excited to see what we get out of them. You know, it's not every day you can grow food from the store and still have good results. So we'll see. I can't remember. Did I mention our obsession with kohlrabi? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know I did. Here's some of the giant kohlrabi. I'm so excited for that. I, I have no idea how it's going to turn out, but if you, if it, if we can judge by how nice these look, oh look, this is the Cossack kohlrabi. It's already starting to bulb up a little bit. Oh yes. Well, the same thing here. We're starting to see a little bit of development. These haven't been in here more than, I don't know, a week and a half or two weeks. So again, they're healthy, they're happy, very little insect damage. We got our beets coming up here. And we have been using a jar um, to cover up some of what we're growing here. And the reason we're using a jar, it kind of creates that greenhouse effect, but it also uh, does a good job of, definitely does a good job of keeping the animals off as the plants start to develop. We have to keep an eye out because they're getting pretty big underneath here. So there's no, no damage, no harm coming to it. It hasn't been hot enough to cause any problems by having the, the glass jar. Just be really careful here. Um, some more beets in each of these. Again, we love our beets. We don't love our weeds so much. So we're also seeing some damage on these. There's some insect damage and damage in general, but most of them look pretty good and they're gonna still taste great, so we have to get those off and harvest those soon as well. As we come around the corner, you can see our peppers here are starting to turn and ripen, which is always a good sign. Our basil here that's gone to seed, and our sunflower that got knocked down and is starting to turn yellow on the back. We haven't messed with this too much. Some of our bigger daikon radishes, and you can see they're developing underneath, but how nice and, and lush those greens are. We planted some other radishes here, but what happened was um, we got we didn't we didn't drill holes in these because we hadn't had rain for so long. It seemed like that wouldn't be an issue, but these got flooded a couple of times in these major rainstorms we had, and so that, accompanied with the insect damage, means that um, these aren't developing the way we want. And in fact, this one's going to seed already, which is not a good sign. These tomatoes going through the exact same thing as the tomatoes over here. Again, we think the magnesium deficiency, but the tomatoes themselves are looking great, looking delicious, as are our peppers, our green peppers here, which we're going to let ripen just like the other ones and turn color and see what they look like in the end. And then of course, we always get to my favorite part in all of this, which would be the cucamelons and the cucamelon are looking so good and so tasty. I'm circling back around to one final plant to show you today. And I saved it for last because it's one I'm really excited about. And this is our first ever jalapeno. And you can see I've let them turn red. I've let the jalapenos turn red and ripen, the ones I'm gonna pick. I did take one of the green ones off and eat it the other day and it has a really nice spice to it, but I'm super excited to harvest these red jalapenos and try them. I love hot peppers and we never grow hot peppers. And I know it's not nearly the hottest pepper out there, but still, I'm excited. Well, thank you so much for joining us for another tour, hopefully a more extended tour than ones we've done in the past to get a feel for where we are in terms of our upcoming planning for fall, in terms of what we still have to harvest now with our sweet potatoes, which is going to be magnificent. Some of the tomatoes I need to harvest right away, the onions, the leeks. We have a lot going on here and a lot more to come. 
So if you enjoyed this video, please give us a like, leave us a comment, and let us know your gardening plans for the next couple of months. And as always, remember to share and subscribe. And most importantly, when you're with us, you're good to grow. <laughs>